Our need for icons, heroes and saviours may be innately human, but it never ever provides us with the proper perspective. The story of Ranger Season, 1986-87, is really one of influence more than mercenary expediency. It's about the increased contribution from older faces, as much as it was about the glittering performance from new ones. This famous success would not have been possible without the weight of goals from Ali McCoy and Robert Fleck, and the odd crucial one from Dave McPherson, the consistent reliability of Stuart Monroe and the maverick uncertainty of Ted McMinn, the dynamic energy of young talent like Ian Durant and Derek Ferguson, as well as the new life that was breathed into the fading light of Davy Cooper. Terry Butcher and Chris Woods were almost ever present, but Graham Soonis played only half the games that season, and Graham Roberts just a third. Rangers built new foundations in the summer of 1986, but it wasn't an oligarch fueled refit with a shiny new player for every position. In an 11 aside sport, there's only so much impact that three or four men can have in a single match. The potential impact they can have on their teammates, however, is almost limitless. Rangers 1986-87 is not a story about how a handful of professional footballers changed a handful of games. It's about how they changed an entire culture. Joining me to discuss that first part of the story is Mr Andy McGowan. How are you, Andy? I'm very good, man. Delighted to be on your, your new flagship show. Very Hi. exciting times. Delighted to have you. And Alan Bradley, welcome, Alan. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, Martin. And like Andy, just delighted to be on. Been through a hang of a time, obviously, leading up to that one. So it's just going to be so good talking about so many positives, you know, ultimately dominating Scottish football. And uh, probably after the maybe seven or eight years preceding that one, Bring it on, please, yeah. Well, let's get started then. Uh, this part of the, the, the series, 86 to 98, this first season is called Ignition. That That's really how I see this this story uh, uh, kind of being, that the, the, the influence that, that Soonis, of course, and Smith, and those crucial signings had on the rest, the, the influence they had on the rest of that dressing room. That dressing room then, Alan, <clears throat> in the April of 1986, which is where we... We left off last week with with John and David, and soon as his uh, appointment being made public, and Jock Wallace being um, let go, um, Walter Smith in his book talks about the disappointment he felt uh, on arriving, um, just the state of the dressing room, the state of of how things were done, uh, the, the the strips, the the training gear just left in a in a pile and they were just dried, they weren't washed so they'd be kind of cardboard stiff um, when they were p- uh, put out again it shattered the, the, the illusions that he had that, that Rangers would be the best of the best, um, kind of Rangers class as, as many of that, that generation would, would call it um, a kind of aura had vanished from Rangers by 1986 hadn't it? Yeah I, I think so and as you say that aura had gone way back to I can probably through you know obviously through Scott Simon and so on uh, I only picked that up, obviously, reading it, Martin, but yeah, it certainly had gone. Uh, the, there's a lot of good players. There were still some decent players, as obviously we'll see going forward, but the, the standards definitely dropped. And again, we'll get on to it once Graham Soonis and Walter Smith come in. We fairly quickly managed to you know, return to some of those old Rangers you know, the sort of qualities and the way we should carry ourselves and just the level of our professionalism. Now, I, I don't know as well when, certainly when we looked into, obviously, the Wallace stuff near the end, mm. and I know Big Joke Wallace says himself that in that last season, it was beginning to, the illness was beginning to impact on him, you know, with all of the stress, the way mm. things were going. He didn't have that same, you know, kind of up and at him, the fight about him, he felt quite down and he felt there was a wee bit of an impact so I don't know if maybe there was a wee bit of that that obviously crept into you know how things were going because certainly prior to that when it would have appeared that Rangers you know certainly a few years before would still have had some of those good standards but you're right at that point in time really reading what you know Walter said about it my goodness we needed something Martin. Okay so Wallace is gone but Alex Totten remains in charge because the plan is that, that you know soon as is going to come in the summer I mean he's still got he, he's contract left at Sampdoria uh, and Smith is still the assistant manager at Dundee United uh, and a uh, Rangers are in a, a dog fight for fifth spot and a fifth spot will get UEFA Cup football uh, next year they're in this fight with Dundee uh, 12th of April Rangers go to Clyde Bank uh, and as we 
we'll go through 86, 87, the season that, that, that follows. Um, the absolute whipping boys uh, for Rangers. They were a very convenient team to play. But Rangers lose 2-1 uh, at Kilbowie uh, and really plunging this this, this into to serious jeopardy. A decision was made. Uh, Totten, who was placed in an unfair position, really, um, along with John Haggart and Stan Anderson, were, were, were let go. And a deal was done. For Smith, I think we had to pay uh, some like fifty thousand pounds compensation, which Walt Smith was raging at because I mean, Smith uh, McLean had spent about seven grand to take him from Dumbarton or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, but it was done quickly. It was done very businessmanlike uh, by by David Holmes. Um, but you were at Kilbowie that day. You, you were very young, of course, at the time. But you, your your memories of what what you were seeing and I guess what the the the, the handful of games that were left. Perhaps told you. Yeah, so I'm I'm ten year old, so you're, you're going to uh, put my my recollections in context. That was ten year old, but um, I remember this vividly. And the fact that I mean that sense you've said there, Martin, they were fighting for fifth to get into Europe. Two, two remarkable things: the fact that fifth got you into Europe, but also that that was where we are. I, I think Alan's been kind. I think we were we were a joke at that point. Everything had been eroded to the point where. We were in an afterthought. There was no chance of us winning the league. We got excited that this season we're talking about when we won, you know, the first ten games. We, we were top of the league. Uh, there, there was no heroes for me, is my recollection. When you look through that squad, then David Cooper was the only guy that I would say was a hero. You had Derek Ferguson and Ian Durant as as young, promising, up and coming players, but there was nobody there that was a talisman apart from Cooper. And as you say. <clears throat> Well, my recollection was he was scoring loads of goals, but the, the jury was still out on him. And whether that's just classic Rangers unfair fight. Rangers yeah. support, looking mm-hmm. for perfection in a, in a young player, I don't know. But I, I don't, you certainly know the Alan McCoy we think of now, or we think we think um, through the glory years. It was. <clears throat> I, I don't think there was much leeway or goodwill given to many of these players because it wasn't working. They, no, they failed. They were failing more more often than succeeding. To be honest, with the odd League Cup win here or there, but that game you speak of at Clyde Bank, I remember it vividly because it was an exciting time, and you were waiting for what was next because you knew something big was going to happen. You knew there was an explosion going to happen. Um, we didn't know the details of how you were in this bit of limbo because you had Sunis in Italy still playing for Sampdoria. <clears throat> you had the World Cup coming up, which he was going to, so you had the kind of crazy prospect of a Rangers manager or a player manager playing at a World Cup and captain in your country so it was so exciting so new so fresh the concept of a player manager was something that wasn't really done I'm trying to think of who else we would have had at that point in time in British football as a player manager and we're going to Clyde Bank and you're going to Old Kilbury with the with the wooden benches and, and that day before we went and the bus went by and I got a, a wave off David Cooper. That's how I remember it. And that's how I, I started to think, you know, he was the only guy I wanted a wave off of. And it was just a disastrous game. And th- there was no protest or howl of derision because it was a shock result, but it wasn't a shock result, if that makes sense, because th- this squad had Felt won the race. Yeah, yeah. And and really, you're looking at them saying, you'll not be here, you'll not be here, you'll not be here. We thought a clear out was in when the cards and, and the, the, the press at that time were full of sensational first 11s that we might have and, you know, all the best players for England and, and guys like Liam Brady and Phil Kyle and crazy talk in the papers so that your imagination was allowed to run riot because this was the kind of the kind of idea of what was going to happen next. But disaster is a result and, as you say, it hastened the, the end for Totten. I, I, I didn't know at the time, but you're absolutely correct. Really unfair on Tottenham. I mean, Tottenham went on to prove he was an exceptionally good manager. Yeah. And he uh, was Rangers through and through, is, is my understanding. And it, and, it, and it caught him deep. But it was, you know, we had to we had to qualify for Europe. So, you know, it was desperation stakes after that result. Yeah. Smith's uh, first game in charge was, was uh, another defeat. Uh, away to St Myrna Love Street 2-1 which put us behind Dundee uh, in, in the race for this European spot he brought in uh, Don Mackay former Coventry City and, and, and Dundee manager um, as a bit of experience in there to, to, to assist with the crucial final fortnight uh, 
and the next game could not have been less attractive. Uh, Rangers' record at this point at Pataudry uh, was the, the the stuff of nightmares. One win in the previous 25 visits that included 17 defeats. Uh, and we're in a position now, Alan, where Rangers couldn't afford to to, to lose, certainly. Um, and going to, going to Aberdeen was just the last place you would go. But Rangers drew 1-1. Uh, were pegged back. A brilliant Ted McMahon goal put Rangers ahead. Um, by all accounts, uh, a very uh, impressive performance. And an early sign, I guess, of Walter Smith's quiet, calm assurance. He talked about the, the performance from Davy Cooper that day. He said, look, you know, there are good players at this club, but they just need confidence. And then Davy's basically one of those. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the point that I wanted to make. Even if you look at the team, I, I take Andy's point about the way things had gone with results and so on. They'd managed to raise their game every now and then. For example, even the four each one. I know some people are against Celtic and so on. But there were players there. If you look at them, there was McCoy's to, well, 25 goals and amongst a pretty poor team. Mm. I still think it's no bad. You've got Stuart Monroe, you've got Ted McMinn, McPherson, Robert Fleckle gone as well, Durant, Derek Ferguson. So uh, my point is there were still some still some good players which were put to use you know in the year after that one as well obviously with the different management in it and the standards being raised but I put Audrey and back to that one I don't know how many times we went up there I think it was something like 17 times but we were continually it was a bit like the times where mind we wouldn't win at Parkhead in nine years or do you know what I mean yeah, in nine years a bad one yeah but we did, as you say, we actually, and it probably would have been, you know, the kind of Walter Smith, the way they did it. But I do remember battering them. I think they equalised quite late on, Martin, yeah, to, Hewitt, to be honest yeah. with you. Uh, and then obviously all from there, it then goes down to, I think Mother will obviously be played in the last game of the season. And that was a strange one too, because obviously we managed to go through, I think that was the same time that Dundee, they managed to beat Hearts up at... Well, Dundee had lost... With the Aberdeen game, Dundee had lost at Celtic, so Rangers were yeah. back in, in yeah. pole position. Uh, Rangers played Motherwell on the final day. We won 2-0. Yeah. McCoy and McPherson scored. This is... Graham Souness is now in charge, by the way. That, yeah. This is Souness' I... first official game. Um, and... But, but that, that was the Dundee one, where yes. Dundee, obviously, against Hearts, up yes. there, the Albert kid thingy. Yeah. But I remember it was a strange one, too, and it's, it's kind of quite like Andy said, too. In one bit, you're going, well, that's good, we're in Europe... But to be honest with you, being a Rangers fan, it was like they've won the league. It just seems strange. But we had this excitement knowing, look, Sunis is coming. We've obviously got Smith. And as Andy said at the time as well, we're thinking, who else are we going to get in terms of different players? So, But I remember that was a weird one. I think the crowd actually increased a wee bit. 21,000 pro- on, on that yeah. day, Alan. Uh highest of the season I think or certainly one of the highest of the season um, it was the biggest crowd of the day in Scotland certainly um, yep. but still a half full Ibrox so we weren't oh, yeah. quite tempting you all back in, in, in thousands uh, but th- th- that would come so Rangers get the job done um, but as you've you've intimated there Alan uh, you know Dundee did win they beat Hearts uh, which on the final day um, gave Celtic the, the, the title yeah, um, and it's, it's funny that you you mentioned the supporters feeling a, a sense of, of, of mixed mixed feeling. so did the Rangers players and, and soon as couldn't quite understand the dressing room being so despondent so well, you've 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 done mm-hmm. your first job you, you've, you've qualified for Europe that this is important um but he wasn't steeped in this he, he didn't understand that kind of duality but he would have a chance very quickly to to properly understand it because the next weekend or the Friday night was, was the Glasgow Cup final. Now, as it is now, but yeah, as it was at the time, a bit of a, a side show. Uh, quite a lot of youth players would be played there, but it was decided that they, you know, both uh, Rangers and Celtic would, would give it a good bash in terms of the, the teams that they uh, put out. Graham Souness is in a dugout. Celtic are just the champions, uh, 40,000 um, made their way to Ibrox that night. Traffic chaos. Uh, one Rangers player got caught up in that traffic. Uh, a certain Mr. <laughs> McCoy's too. Yeah, not exactly true. known for his um, punctuality anyway. Um, Rangers won 3-2. McCoy's hat-trick, uh, the, the winner, extra time, 25 yards, just an alley goal. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe turning in, Andy, to the, the, the kind of player that we uh, we we kind of come to know, although he, of course he scored that hat-trick in the, the 84 League Cup final. I'll ask you about the game in a, in a minute, um, Alan. But what what I found interesting, just doing the research for the for the book, David Hay that week. Remember, 
now champion of Scotland, talks about a new old firm era, not a new Celtic era. Um, all the signs, he says, that ourselves and Rangers can go on from here to bigger and better things, and it's exciting time for the old firm in general. Now, he wasn't wrong. No other club would win a league title since then. But it told me how indicative that was of the threat that they felt immediately, talking about Rangers as title rivals, when we had not bothered a title race in the best part of a decade. Um, that kind of, I found that really, really telling, that when he's just won a league championship, that he would be talking about Rangers and Celtic being the, the, the big ticket next year. Yeah, and I think even the media training, even if personally I'd thought about that one, I don't know if you'd been the other side, mm. if it'd been our manager, we would have been wanting, well, quite frankly, we've just won the league, we're going on to better things, there's going to be a challenge, but we'll just You wouldn't take mention them. So, so it's a straight, such a strange thing to come yeah. out with, yeah. yeah. What about the game? I don't want really to focus too much time on a friendly, but I mean, Walter oh. Smith certainly, again, writes how important that was, just psychologically, and it told them what could be done with energy and energy from the fans, energy from, from around the ground and, and these players. Um, seems a good game by all accounts. It was a great, great atmosphere. I, uh, I think I actually had been married in the January of that year, so took Margaret to her first Old Firm game, and we were in the Govan, pretty much at the Copeland, you know, the Govan rear, but pretty much towards the Copeland. And again, she was just watching, but the, the atmosphere was brilliant. Funnily enough, I talked before, I think when I've, when I've spoken to you guys and who are you, about embarrassing moment. My embarrassing moment was after a few minutes, Rangers having a chance, the ball dropping to McCoy, and just like Andy had said, and me standing up, McCoy's not finishing and calling up, posing so-and-so, and looking at Margaret as if, hey, I know a bit about football and sat down. <laughs> now, obviously, at the end of the game, she was going, that was that chap you they were shouting at, Alan. <laughs> and, and I think that said a lot. I think Andy's right. From the word go, even way, way, Alan McCoy, even early on, if he scored at Parkhead in his first one, there was that kind of mixed feeling about him. I, I don't know. But as I say, that was my most embarrassing moment. But yeah, the game, we, we scored early. I think McCoy's for Hugh Burns. Uh, Brian McClure uh, get one just before half time. We get another one 76 minutes. And then we, uh, Mo Johnson, equalise right near the end. I remember, because any extra time, I can mind Shuggy Burns going down with cramp and so on, but Rangers really played so well. And the atmosphere, I mean, Ibrox was bouncing that night. And to actually win it, really strange, because again, a bit like, like the kind of Motherwell one, but with this one, it was like, a, well, that's fine. They've won the league now. But it really set, a, I feel, a marker psychologically as well for, look, we're going to get better now. You know, you had won the league. And I think psychologically too with Celtic, whether that ended up coming the David Hay one, but I think it must have fit them as, geez, you know, they've just played us off the park here. And by the way, the Celtic team was pretty much the first team. Yeah, both, would... both sides really, really uh, went for it. Moved to the Friday night, not to overshadow the, the Scottish Cup final. The, the, the following I day, I think it was St Mirren. Was it Ian Ferguson? No, it was uh, Hearts. Aberdeen. Hearts' Aberdeen. capitulation there uh, uh, being complete when they, they oh, were that... uh, battered by Aberdeen. Uh, they were going for a double and uh, fell down the last the last two days. But um, yeah. early that day, uh, Rangers uh, fire basically, or they certainly let go. Uh, Derek Johnson, Dave McKinnon, Billy Davis, Andy Bruce, Eric Ferguson, uh, John McDonald, and Dougie Bell told her on the transfer list. Uh, McDonald would go to Barnsley, but uh, Dougie Bell would remain there for the rest of the season. And I guess technically, as soon as his first signing, if you don't include himself, um, was the extension of Ali McCoy's contract that night. It was supposed to be done before the game, but as I mm -hmm. said, he was late. Uh, and I guess a hat trick uh, maybe added a wee bit of value on there. He pretended <laughs> that he, yeah. he wasn't going to do it. Um, he wasn't going to sign uh, and then crack the jokes. I think David Holmes says, look, Ali, would you just sign this and let me go to my bed? It's been a, been a long day. Um, there was never any question of doing that. Andy, you, you mentioned the the speculation starting pretty early. It would only increase in the summer, but it, it wasn't just confined to the likes of the Daily Record um, and the Evening Times and Glasgow, basically. Um, because, incredibly, on this greatest show of, uh, on Earth, the World Cup, um, the old Glasgow Rangers were, were, were being talked about in, in, in various uh, camps uh, around the competition. Um, because, you know, the, the thinking was that the, the net was going to be spread uh, far and wide. Uh, clearly, it would be in the Scotland camp, because you've got Walter Smith in the 
you know, the, the, the staff there, soon as the captain. Richard Goff was a big target, um, and, and he was there, uh, but I think Goff and Smith knew that that was never going to be uh, a goer. Jim McLean was simply not going to sell to a rival. Um, the Catholic thing had come up immediately um, at the, the Sooners press conference, and Chick Young had got some time with Sooners on the, the plane to um, uh, Santa Fe, uh, and he gave quite a, a revealing kind of interview. He's like, you know, what do they want? Do they, you know, they want a Tanian team or they want a successful one? You know, I will sign a Catholic player. It could have been very quickly done, couldn't it? Uh, Ali Dick of, of, of Spurs was the uh, the one that was very close to happening. He started, or his family started to talk about it and Sunis wasn't impressed with that and, and, and shut it down. Yep. Sunis ripped up the rules. And, and you're, you're talking about Davy Hay there uh, and, and him referencing uh, the kind of it's almost as if he's, he's attaching himself to our coattails mm-hmm. because it was that seismic. And I, I can only... I'm trying to think of a kind of comparison so that younger listeners get it. It was like being taken over by Arab sheiks mm-hmm. without the sheiks mm-hmm. because Sunnis was such a massive name, it was such a massive statement of intent, and it was just a case of we're going to go big very, very quickly. And I know in transfer-wise... I mean, it wasn't much of a bar to, to blow up because your transfer business had been very, very modest for a long, long time. And, and it was quite laughable that Celtic got the biscuit, biscuit tin <laughs> kind of badge because we were pretty much the same. We wouldn't yeah. keep John McClelland. We wouldn't pay more money for, you know, players that went on to cause us great harm. And so it was as if the shackles had been taken off our ambitions completely. Um, and as you say... That statement about the Catholic thing came up very, very early because it was good tabloid fodder, but also I think it suited Sunnis to kind of make a statement that he was he wasn't going to cry to the Rangers fans even if it meant they didn't like him. Yeah. And and, as we, and we've seen that through the years, didn't we? He would do his way or the highway, and really it didn't matter what MD said to him or what MD thought. Um, and Ali Dick, I mean. I don't really remember him a player. I remember him being a player of great promise. It never really fulfilled it at Ajax and Spurs. And he, he was always, even before soon as he was kind of wheeled out sometimes as a convenient RC that could sign mm-hmm. for Rangers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was an intent and it was a signal to the support as well that you're either with me or you're not because we're going somewhere. Um, and we've seen that with the first couple of signings, you know. Um, at the World Cup, and I, and I mentioned earlier on the fact that we had soon as at the World Cup so there was this anticipation that, you know, he, he was there. The new stuff was going on in the background because the papers were full of it. Players like Goff were getting mentioned. But it started to go up a notch by my memory because we were getting, we then get linked with, um, well, first of all, Chris Woods, we broke the world record for a goalkeeper. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll come to that. Falca, Alex Cameron in the, well, the Daily Record Sunday Mail at the time. Because um, he, soon as he soon as he'd told Chet Young and others that, look, we are going <clears> to... <throat> get some players in but there's going to be a big one like a proper big one and he thought it might be the Brazilian Falcao now he played at Rome at the time and Rangers were going to be ambitious maybe not Serie A ambitious uh, that, that was probably just uh, slightly out, out, outside of that uh, that reach but if the the Scotland camp in Santa Fe was where uh, a lot of the chat was uh, there was also chat about Rangers in Colorado Springs where England were uh, where rumours started that, that one player had agreed to, to, to join Rangers Um and eventually this turned out to be Chris Woods. Now, Rangers had inquired about Peter Shilton, um, and he said he wasn't prepared to move. Um, but England played Scotland uh, before the World Cup. England won 2-1 at Wembley. Soon as scored, Dan Butcher scored. Um, and soon as had spoken to Woods that night and pretty much had the, the, the agreement in place. Um and yeah, it was, it was announced during the World Cup that the Rangers were going to pay £600,000 for Chris Woods, a world record for a goalkeeper. Um, Terry Butcher thought he was off his head. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why, why are you going to do this? You, you, you jeopardising your, your England chances, you know, you're, you're kind of next in line. And Butcher was the next one. Um, uh, before England left, he was definitely going. He was leaving Ipswich Town. That, that that season, Spurs and Manchester United were were, were in for him. Um, Woods was 
pressuring him. Rangers were then linked just before England left. Um, but Woods was pressuring him that the journalist um, from the Daily Mirror, Bob Harris, who was a friend of Graham Souness, was inside the England camp and he was always in his ear. To be fair to Butcher, I think he wanted to put all of it out of his mind and just con- concentrate on, on, on having a good World Cup, which he did. And he played for the rest of the world, 11, uh, against the, the, the Americas uh, for UNICEF, uh, the, the Pasadena Rose Bowl in Los Angeles. Um, and after the game, was up in the Hollywood Hills having quite the party with Diego and uh, all the other players involved. And he was very drunk at 3am when his phone went in his hotel room and it was Graham Souness, um saying, can I meet you? when you get off your plane in London tomorrow and we can chat about this, which they did. They, they messed up the hotel. Um, Butcher forgot basically what, what it was, what holiday and it was, went to the wrong one as um, soon as eventually found them. And I think, boys, that, that Butcher had in his mind that it would be a wee chat over some much-needed coffee to get rid of the hangover. Um, he'd go back and have a sleep and then they'd talk about it again. But but soon as wasn't for having that, he got him on a flight to Edinburgh uh, and then took him to Ibrox because... And soon as his mind, then he needed to get these players to the stadium. Once they were in the stadium, he could sell Rangers to the players. Uh, Butcher's wife was firmly behind. She wanted to move the family up there, um, but he still wanted to go to Manchester United. And if they had made the offer, Rangers had offered seven hundred thousand pounds up front. Um, and if United had done that, he he, pro- he said he probably would have gone to United. Saved by Bobby Charlton, who who told Ron Atkinson he didn't need a, another centre half. He enough there. Um, Spurs wanted Butcher to come down and, and basically train for a bit uh, to see um, so this was kind of what he was left with and to be fair he felt that Rangers were great with him um, really good, he trained for a couple of days and, and, and then eventually um, he signed he was staying at a, the, the hotel in, in, in Edinburgh owned by a man called David Murray um, was used by Frank Bruno and other Commonwealth Games athletes because the Commonwealth Games was of course in Edinburgh at the time um, but it was done uh, Andy um now, this must have been big. This is where the, the eyebrows started getting raised. <laughs> <laughs> and there was chat about it. And I, I remember that uh, Unicef, was a UNICEF game. Did you yeah, see the charity yeah, yeah. game? Yeah. The butcher scored. That, but, aye, he scored. And I remember it vividly because it was live on TV and it was the night before my birthday, the 27th of July, 1986. And you're watching it. And it was a friendly, right? But... Butcher could pass a ball. He you could. know, we know the big long raking passes he used to put over the head of Robert Flake, and he was doing that in this game. And you're sitting there thinking, so this guy could be playing for Rangers, but it was more than 10 again, just like soon as it was the fact you were getting a, a major name, and it had never, ever been done before. It was totally, even a matter of three months before this, it was total fantasy to think that we would be signing players from England, never mind signing. The you know almost captain of England and a, and a mainstay of the English national team for by that point a good four or five years it was fantasy so this is where things started to get interesting because we thought the world was an oyster this was proof positive that it was because um, to get him plus Woods in the first couple of you know signing period was major very very big and uh, you, you allowed yourself to dream because we were then thinking you know we are going for this here. This isn't us coming to uh, have a wee incremental step up. We were going for it. Um, so a major, the, the second, or maybe the third, I should say, because Woods was a statement of intent as well, breaking that world record for a goalkeeper. Mm. It was a third statement of intent. Soonest Woods, Butcher, in there you had Colin West as well. Colin West would be lesser. It. Yeah. Uh, uh, from, from Watford but, would, would finish, the basically finish the summer. But... Um, uh, I want to, uh, yeah, I'm interested in, b- in both uh, just continue this idea about intent. Uh, Alan, I'll come to you first and back to you, Andy. Um, because these are big signings and, you know, as soon as kind of gave up and go off and a bit of a parting shot, it's, it's, a, it's sad for Scottish football that, you know, the, our money's had to go outside the game um, just because, you know, they, they won't play ball. Jock Wallace had, before he was sacked, of course, he'd be thinking ahead to the summer. He has transferred targets that summer where Gordon Jury of Hibs John Brown of Dundee and Craig Levine of Hearts. Now, of course, Jury and Brown would eventually arrive and be good club servants. I don't think Craig Levine would have been out of place too much in, in that Rangers team in April 86. Um, and I'm sure there'd be plenty around Scottish football that would have applauded Rangers for again, putting some faith in youth. These are three young players at the time. 
but it's that small fry compared to what, what's just happened that summer, Alan. Um, 84 85 Rangers and Celtic spent nearly half a million pounds each. And with West, Soonest, Woods and Butcher, you're talking about 1.8 million. Um, David Hay kept getting assurances from the Celtic board that they, you know they would support him as well. Um, in the end, he spent very little on a young Anton Rogan from Lisbon <laughs> Distillery. Um, these are very different summers. Um, and I wonder, Celtic initially, and I think the rest of the country, paralysed by shock about what, what's happening here. They, 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 it's as if they can't adjust. Um, what were your reflections on, on that summer as a whole, just in terms of the ambition? Um, and I guess putting our money where our mouth were. Well, I think a, a couple of things uh, from a, I don't know, a 23, 24 year old guy getting those players, obviously, as you say, you know, as soon as kind of big butcher and woods for a football and point of view, it was like, just wow. Do you know what it was like? You know, you know, the kind of the young ones nowadays with the computer games or whatever. It, it just it was as if we had suddenly gone back to being, you know, like Glasgow Rangers, one of the biggest clubs in, you know, in Britain or after seven years of just kind of going through the motions and so on. This was just like a massive, you know, it was like, you know, absolutely magnificent signings. But I think looking at it, so that that was at that point, we were we were really needing to improve in terms of the spine of the team anyway and in the midfield. So you've got three absolute crackers. Obviously, Big West potentially gave us the, the big man, little man. But I think what people really maybe hadn't spotted was that you mentioned, it, I think, before, Martin, about visionary and the fact that, we had seen the opportunity of what was happening in terms of the English ban, you know, how long that may or may not have gone on. And I think even by him bringing in Woods and Butcher, I think it also sent out a big message to whether it would be guys down in England or on the continent as well. So I think two things. One, football-wise, yeah, absolutely made sense. And as I say, sprinkle some of them with maybe five of the guys that they had before. And we had something, which I think we'll see. Uh, but but to me, th- that really was a big A. The other three that you mentioned, obviously, in the previous time, that would have been, yeah, that seems OK, and it might make Rangers mm, kind of move up a bit. But my God, this blew everybody out of the water, I, I feel, and it gave us such a, a confidence, you, you know, as well, because we didn't know as well that they'd pretty much blown their budget. So because you could sign at different times, in the mindset of us as well, it's like a, and maybe if we need someone else in September, October, we'll go again. You know, yeah, it's ridiculous, but but fantastic, yeah. And and Andy, just a thought about Anton Rogan from Lisbon Distillery being Celtic's <laughs> uh, response to um, two England internationals and uh, the Scotland captain, European Cup winner, etc., etc. Yeah. Well, Anton turned out to be no bad player for Rangers. He did, well, he, so. did. <laughs> he did, yeah, yeah. No, I think. It kind of epitomised the instant golf that happened and Alan's touching something there where there was a mindset shift as well because you know the Rangers fans or the Rangers should ever have an inferiority complex but it was more it was more bravado than anything else mm. up to that point. We were living in past glories, we were living in a name, we were a sleeping giant, all these kind of cliches were rolled out time and time again and without kicking a ball because we hadn't kicked the ball by this point, the, the signings and the statement of 10 that we keep referring to here changed the mindset en masse collectively. So immediately Celtic were on the back foot. And, and the truth was that Celtic, if they had the money, then you know it was, a, it was the days of the old board and uh, dubious ticket and or, or dubious uh, gate receipts yeah, and all yeah. this kind of stuff. Um, very round, I mean, were, very round numbers that they... they, they yeah, they and, and the, 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 the truth... The fact is, they were going to go for a tilt at the European Cup, mm. you know, and it was all European Cup. So at that time, when uh, clubs like Rangers and Celtic, if they go into the European Cup, it was a knockout cup. Anything was possible. You, you, before you knew it, you could be in the quarterfinal, semi-final. So it wasn't beyond the realms of possibility of doing stuff in Europe. But I don't know what happened at Celtic that summer because either it was a case of we're good enough, we don't need to do more. But I think it was more penny pinching and the fact that the new. It was an arms race that they couldn't compete with when they seen what we were doing. Um, they, they would respond, though, we, we will get to 87, 88 in, in, in due course. But um, 
my my reading of or in terms of the research I've done is my reading correct that they, they just looked like they've been shell shocked because Scottish football has been turned upside down. We we do not buy players from England. The best talent goes to England. It does not come this way. And David and John and I in the the, the prologue show last week um, talked about you know the the. the the opportunities after Heisel and the ban were there from 85, 86, but no one saw them until soon as. Not even the Rangers board, by the way. It was soon as it told the board, this is where we're going to spend money. Because Scottish teams will not sell players at, at decent prices, if at all. Um, so this change in vision, it just looks like they've, they've all... They, they, they got it eventually, and we'll, we'll get to that over the coming weeks, but this summer of 86, no one gets it. Martin, I think if you if you compare, sorry guys, if you compare the sides, the, the kind of Celtic squad, even from 85, 86, the only additions really they had were, obviously, Anton Rogan you mentioned, mm. uh, Pai, or sorry, Tony Shepard, Alan McAnally and Derek White. So they were the only ones that were added. Apart from that, it was pretty much the same, apart from no David Proven, and I don't think Mark McGee played. But again, I, I don't know, like Andy said, maybe they just look at the arms race and think, my God, we can't compete with this, so we're going to sit at the moment. But they, they certainly didn't look as if we're going to react now and we're going to build. What, what I was going to say, Martin, was that in business, you hear of businesses being disruptors. They come in and they upset the apple cart and, and mm-hmm. they kind of uh, incumbent, uh, sorry, the, the, the companies that have kind of dominated are talking, they're, they're taken by such a surprise they can't react. And that's kind of what happened. We disrupted it, we broke the model that summer. And a lot of it was to do with the fact that we had that all-seated stadium or a stadium of note. That put us ahead of the game for a lot of clubs. And you spoke as soon as bringing players up to Ibrooks. Now, if they, if they broke players up to Parkhead, that's not going to work because it was, as we know, it, was, it wasn't called the piggery for nothing. But the culture change mm. um, is not something you can just flick a switch on. Mm-hmm. And uh, Celtic didn't have the same personality that was flooding through Ibrooks and Sunis and Smith, I suppose. They didn't have that. They still had Davy Hay, um, one of the old guard, fairly, you know, timid personality. Yeah. And here, here's that another... was just not yeah. a possibility of doing what we've done. Yeah, here's another thing I, I'd, I'd like you, your quick thoughts, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move ahead, but it's, it's a, uh, something that, that John and David and I discussed last week, um, that one of the central things that had that did happen that had to happen for all this this revolution to take place hasn't happened at Celtic at this moment in time which is a clear authority in the boardroom yeah. you've got still got family blocks that are big enough that, that just slow things down and you've got stasis and you can't react quickly they, 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 they cannot adapt quickly to a Rangers board that is really led by the chief exec who has been empowered by a majority shareholder for the first time. Um, mm-hmm. So there's no endless board meetings about meetings, about me. You know, Campbell Logan, we said that previously they'd have a board meeting every week, even if there was nothing to talk about. It was just, it, things get too slow and, and, and cumbersome. And Rangers, in keeping with everything that was going on, I guess, in the southeast of England at, around this time, keep that in mind. Now we're a boardroom that was far more streamlined um, and Celtic were still in that, that old quite stodgy bogged down dynamic that's how I read it anyway and is that is that fair that even if they wanted to react because he did he wanted the board to, to spend some money um, because clearly I go back to that, that Glasgow Cup week he can see something changing here but they can't they 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 just look as I said they look paralysed No you're 100% correct Celtic were run by committee uh, Rangers had either consciously or uncon- subconsciously moved to an executive decision model, but with a guy at the helm in Sunis who kind of straddled both, right? He, because as we've seen in the years went by, he became a director and that kind of stuff. But the the connection between David Holmes, as it was at that time, and Sunis and the vision shared there was so clear and so fueled by ambition that. As I say, Celtic could not move fast enough to replicate or even come close to replicating it. So you're 100 percent correct. Well, we're going to talk about this this culture change then at Ibrooks. 
Uh, and you'd mentioned Andy about Sunis not caring about the, 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 the signing policy. There's a few other things he didn't care about. On the field, quite clearly, and they did a pre-season tour of Germany, the West Germany as it was, um, and all his chat was playing from the back. The, 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 the influence was Liverpool on the field, and patience. Uh, and he said, I expect to be criticised for the way we play, but it's my way and I'm not about to change it. Um, in some ways, it's almost a re-education because of my view that Scottish football in general has gone nowhere for years. Um, we lost 2-0 to Bayern Munich at Ibrox. This was a kind of glamour friendly uh, and drew 1-1 at White Hart Lane for Paul Miller's um, testimonial uh, for Spurs. And he sees that there's some progress. Uh, the players are thinking more about the game than they used to. Sometimes they've tended to play with the heart rather than the head, but we're changing that. On the field, uh, I'll go to Alan first uh, on, on this this playing style. This very aggressive, very quick modernisation of the way that, that Rangers are going to play. Yeah, uh, and it was noticeable even you mentioned the, the Bayern. I remember the Bayern friendly. Uh, the one thing as well was, I mean, Terry Butcher, my goodness, Rolls Royce. You know, but the way we were, we were doing this using the ball, you know, it wasn't a case of just 100 mile an hour, just lump it up. There was, you could see right away, now obviously Walter Smith would have a you know, wee bit of that one as well, but the fitness too, we just looked that bit sharper, despite people talking about, you know, Big Jock gets them all around Galen and so on, and Rangers all run teams off the last 10, 20 minutes or so, but even fitness wise, we seem to just look that wee bit sharper as well, and, and kind of more one-touch stuff as well, Martin, and just moving the ball quicker. So certainly the first impressions were really positive, you, you know, for myself, compared to what we've been watching previously. Yeah. Uh, interesting you mentioned fitness there, because Andy, off the field, the inspiration is Italian. It's, it's those, uh-huh. those those years in Italy, that, that, that soon as, or that year in Italy that Sunis has had. Um, and, yeah, it's... It, it, the Jock Wallace thing, and this is fit Rangers team, ultra fit. Mm-hmm. Zunas is 33 years old, and he is fitter than anyone else in that team. Um, so the the kind of sadistic hand, uh, San Juan thing is, is, is binned. It's more nuanced, professional, modern techniques from Italy, double sessions, a lot of work with the ball, and silly things. Being in the hotel, the night before a game, flip flops now compulsory so that you know the feet don't get ruined. Um, no golf because you know they need the players a hundred percent. Jacuzzis and saunas, proper washing machines. The club suits now are Manny rather than Slaters. Um, and you know, Ian Durant said, "Look, you know, he he knew football players were, were creatures of routine. He they, they wanted to be looked after well so they could give their best, and he transformed the place from the bottom up to make sure it worked that way." Um, those added pieces of professionalism sound trivial, but but they mattered. And I guess, going back to what Smith found when he turned up, Andy, when you have a decay at a club, it's the little things that go first. And it's the little things that are quite easy to bring back very quickly. Italian football was a city, the shining city on the hill yeah. at that point, wasn't it? And as soon as came back, an evangelist for it. And and if we think to, I mean, we obviously have Rangers TV, wall to wall coverage, and at that point, what you were devouring was the Rangers news and minuscule snippets you might see on the news. And I remember vividly that, you know, the first train session or one of the first train sessions, and it was probably Jordan Hill that we were training that, and it was in the sun, and as soon as he's leading it, and he's doing stretches that we've never seen before. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and you spoke about the flip flops here, uh, Martin. They're talking about pasta, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, and and this is where the influence of the Sunnis Revolution goes beyond just Rangers because it changed Scottish football. I went mm-hmm. out. I, I'm ten year old, eleven year old. I'm like, I'm mum. I need to get a pair of flip flops. Yeah, I'm walking through the house and fucking <laughs> flip flops is freezing. Yeah. I kicked them off. I went through the, the the front window of the house. That's a true story. <laughs> so there's things like that happening at grassroots level because people are looking at football, Scottish football differently and it's went from kick and rush to this um, uh, more th- it's not like what we've got now but there was a more thought- thoughtful approach to how you build up the play and Alan's exactly right, I vividly remember the Bayern Munich game, we're playing a top team we want to see Butcher there was grumbles, I remember there being grumbles running about us and people saying shut up because this is the way we're going to play them. Yeah, you know yeah. There was, there was a people that wanted to kick and rush up the park and then there was people that said, no, this is changing and we need to get used to it. 
So it was a really, really interesting time and, and actually um, quite pivotal in, in modernisation of Scottish football. Jimmy Sanderson uh, from Radio Clyde, the man who I think made famous Where You At The Game caller, um, also had a column in, in the Evening Times, uh, and this is two weeks before the first league match of the season, he says, it's obvious that the Soonest and Smith regime know the score, but they will now find that the honeymoon is over. It's two weeks before the season and the honeymoon's over. Um, so there's a bit of hysteria, but there was one part of that, the editorial, that, that Soonest would have done well to pay heed to. Um, our domestic game for him is a minefield that is booby-trapped with problems. He will have, with Smith's help, to adapt fast and accurately. Uh, fast forward then, gentlemen, to Easter Road on the first Saturday of the season. A beautiful, warm, glorious, sunny afternoon. Um, and the, the, the hype is, 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 is pretty huge. We'll come to the moment the game's probably remembered for in a moment. Um, the football in that first 45 minutes probably typifies a lot of what we would see from that first half of the season from Rangers. There is good stuff. There is patient play. If there are long passes, they're probably sprayed rather than punted as they may have been before. There's purpose to it. Um, the Rangers goal is a penalty scored by Ali McCoy, the first official goal of um, this uh, era. Uh, and... The, the play between him and West to win that penalty is genuinely good and intelligent and, and, and graceful. But there's there's so many errors. The two goals that Rangers concede uh, either side of that, that McCoy's equaliser, uh, it's comical defending. Terry Butcher, this much hyped, uh, expensive um, England international, England captain, uh, gets caught under a ball. Um, it, it, Woods doesn't look particularly clever either. Um, and Rangers are, are two one down at, at half time, and that's how it would stay. Uh, but as we know, and as we're about to hear now, that is not what the game is most remembered for. Good play from Sunis. Immediately under pressure now from BD. Well, that's an aspect of the Scottish game with which Graham Hughes may not be familiar. And Templars have gone completely now. The class game BD as soon as he's in the heart of it. Chris Woods wants to take his own kind of action. And this is a dreadful scene inside Easter Road. And off the ball, more trouble as Mark Fulton goes down. A collision with Colin West. And now the hip players turn their attention on the former Watford striker. Now, Graham Souness may be in severe trouble here. He's already been booked, remember? Well, the game has been simmering right from the start. A flashpoint was perhaps inevitable. We've seen it now, and one action will be taken by referee Delaney. The hip supporters going wild on the far side, but the red card has been shown to Graham Souness. Okay, Ali McCoist uh, in his 92 book says it was some very inflammatory shouts from McCluskey right at the beginning of the match went a long way to creating the atmosphere in the park that day. It's one of the nastiest games that I've ever played in. I've never, and I mean never, seen a team so fired up against us as Hibs were that afternoon. Um, we'll get to the instance in a moment, Alan and Andy, but I'll ask you, Andy, uh, Alan, first. Uh, even in the, the highlights, it does come over that there's a very thick air um, of, of, of tension and hatred uh, around Easter Road that day because I guess Rangers were very much there to be shot at. Yeah, we, I mean, obviously we had a wee bit of history in terms of, you know, playing Hibs Easter Road or whatever, so we never really got on that well. But this, because of the soonest coming, and to be honest with you, I, th I think even before we actually got Sunnis in charge, there was quite a lot of even Rangers fan going, look at this guy. He thinks he's, you know, he'd be, he'd be eat himself kind of thing. You know, Respected, he's, not loved. He, absolutely. And then the minute he obviously came to us, suddenly became a easier guy and my God, we loved him. But I think that obviously the rest of Scottish football will be, who the hang does this guy think he's coming? Oh, Rangers think they're going to. So in a way, it was almost as if they'd kind of targeted them. There was a, oh, you bloody think so attitude. And you could tell even before the game started, I don't know the atmosphere in there, it just seemed just that wee bit more, you know, intense. 
Uh, I think even in terms of playing the game too, we tried to play that kind of nice, deliberate passing. But that's the other point I think I wanted to make on this one. Uh, to me, it's the, the classic. We know we get players coming from England or from elsewhere. And it's another thing being able to in the hurly burly mm-hmm. to be able there to mix it to try and you know keep controlled and so on, and they will eventually get to it. I think we just obviously get caught up. And Graham soon has been the guy quite rightly. If I was in the middle and people were coming for me, what's he going to do, Martin? Is he going to back down? I don't bloody think so. Now I know his dad and David Holmes and all that would say you maybe would do it differently, but in a way, I think I'm standing going. I, you know, I'll give you as much. And I think as well, what was really good for me was the fact that all of the Rangers players get right in about it too. And I think at the end of it too, I remember maybe reading even the next day or soon as making some quote about, mm. yeah, you might occasionally, they'll beat us, but my God, when it comes to fighting and so on, if people, and that was good too, uh, you know, added to that point about, we used to talk about, you know, we've got this kind of legacy, we've got this history, you know, the famous Glasgow Rangers. But to me, that just added another wee bit too, which gave us confidence as well, you know, going forward. But no, I would imagine, OK, you get it with the old firm games, but my God, I mean, this was probably worse than Pataudry, you know, the way it is now, yeah. Martin, yeah? Yeah, oh, it, it just it seemed absolutely visceral. Andy, I think there's a preemptive strike because uh, Smith has warned... <laughs> soon as hasn't he um uh who to who to kind of get um and i think he gets the wrong guy doesn't he really but he, he, he he's a preemptive tackle on on billy cup it's an outrageous tackle um and he gets booked and he's almost smiling as he gets booked because he, he knows what he's doing he knows what's coming then it starts to, to increase chris woods is kind of bundled um kind of 1930s style uh, a corner by george mccluskey um and again, a lot of blue shots around, demanding action, and it's it's starting to get a a, a wee bit hot. Um, and then the, the answer itself, soon as tackled by by, by Stuart Beatty, he should have gone down. I mean, he, he would have got a free mm-hmm. kick. It was a yeah. foul, um, but he stays on his feet. He careers then into McCluskey. Um, does a melee and he kicks out. And they, I mean, the gash needed nine stitches. Um, and he's, he's obviously sent off as uh, McCluskey's carried off that that famous photo. He's kind of smirking, and then he, he does see his dad in the, the main stand, kind of looking down, shaking his head. And soon as said, it's you know the worst moment in his his professional career. Um, as Alan says, the entire Rangers team, nearly both teams, because I think Alan Ruff is the only one who, who stayed out of it, uh, got involved. Rangers were fined £5,000 and Hibs a 1000 uh, and, and a straight red for, for the new Rangers manager. Um, not for the first time, he, he kind of apologised for his own actions, but had a pride in the fact that his team kind of rallied round. You weren't at Easter Road that day. Um, I was in Mallorca. On holiday, my dad, my dad phoned home, yeah. and uh, right, and uh, a sense of deflation, really. That after all that excitement, um, we'd lost. The new guy was losing the head, going around, you know, uh, uh, assaulting people and and, and and whatever. Butcher could have gone off easily, could have gone off in the second half with an elbow. Um, can you remember the feelings that that tea time? <laughs> I, I can. My dad was at the game, so he got to go. Uh, I think I listened in the radio because that was all you could do then. And bef- just before I go into the game, but this was how, how much of fever pitch Scottish football had reached because of the anticipation for the new Rangers. And soon as was the lightning rod for it, and to be honest, he couldn't handle it. He, a couple of times this season, he, he couldn't handle it, as you say. But for that game, um, my dad came in the door, so I've listened and it's happened. I'm super disappointed. I don't really get any other context than the, the result. My dad came in the door that day and as he would, I'm jumping up and saying, what was it like and what was this? And my dad was effervescent with enthusiasm because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of the fight and the fact yeah. that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, of no surrender, spirit was there. And there were glimpses of, despite the mistakes for Butcher and the, the confusion defensively, you know, you could see Alan referred to him as a Rolls Royce not by a Munich game. You could see he was he was for a different planet yeah, if yeah. otherwise, you know. So uh, that anticipation of was round the corner as a Rangers supporter was still there. And this was kinda of a blip. It was quite a sore blip, quite a big blip. It wasn't expected, it was a shock. But we now look back at that man, you think, well, could it have been anything thus? Because yeah. it was probably proof positive that, you know, Rangers are always the big fish to be you know, 
captured or whatever caught, that had just went up tenfold. And Hibbs's reaction and attitude towards Rangers that day, if any of our players, or, or Sunnis in fact, ever thought, you know, this was going to be a cakewalk, they, they realised that it wasn't going to be. Um, it was the first stage of Sunnis acclimatising to the proper way of thinking, right? Because you've, you've alluded to it, Martin, that he was kind of pragmatic. He was, so, he was so arrogant that he thought, you know, it's just another three points in an all-firm game. I remember him saying that. And I would be thinking, no, no, you're, you're, com- you're completely wrong there. It was things like that. He would come out with in your lap, right? Well, actually you Maybe he'd never been immersed in it. How, no, how would he know? hadn't he? He'd, he'd, he'd been away never... from Scotland since yeah. 16. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, that's that's the adjustment, and it's a fascinating adjustment. Um it was a huge blow. Ian Durant said, you know, the dressing room afterwards was silent, stunned. We'd been billed as invincible and we believed it. Uh, Soonis and Butcher were, were staying at the, you know, Norton House, as I said, in, in Edinburgh, uh, went out to drown their sorrows, uh, met someone who had a better day than they did, and someone was basically winding Soonis up. Um, and Graham told them to fuck off before Terry Butcher <laughs> thought that's probably <laughs> enough for the night, Gaffer. Uh, we're getting in a taxi and, and getting back to the, 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 the hotel. Um, we're going to hear now from the man who really showed that leadership on the Monday, David Holmes. People thought I was just starting, but yeah, I'd been I'd been at this for some twelve months before that, and you know, in thirty-seven minutes, I watched the twelve months work gone out the door. But I came to terms with it over that weekend. You know, Betty and I went home and we shut the door and we didn't go out. I didn't come any, anywhere near anyone until the Monday when I came back in here. But by that time, I had actually come to terms with what had happened and I had uh, accepted all the criticism in the paper and on the media. And I was resolved to start again, as from that particular day. And the first thing I did was call the, a meeting with all the lads and I put it to them where I stood and where they stood and what I expected, as from now. And there's just something understatedly authoritative about David Holmes, Alan. Um, he felt it. And he said, you know, as you heard there, um, uh, all this work, um, you know, disappearing uh, after 37 minutes, um, shutting the curtains when, when him and Betty get, get back to their, their, their house. Um, but came in on the Monday, uh, told everyone what the, 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 the score was and what was expected of them and they have a target on their backs and they, they have to accept that uh, and, and kind of move on. He's a forgotten man and I think it's a bit of a disgrace that he is, really. I think so. I mean, leadership definitely springs to mind with him. Even, I think, his background and where he came from and to actually get to the position that he did even before he takes over this Rangers one but no, to me, to me leadership was the, the big thing with David Holmes I, I even saw an interview I think with Graham Soonis at one point talking about you know we we're, we're work really closely together we have the odd argument but my god you're never going to win one mm. so no I, I think he carried himself really well and I, as you say I think in history certainly up to now I don't really think David Holmes gets the recognition you know that he, he deserves you know, at this point in time, but no, I certainly let them know in no uncertain terms. And to be honest with you, I think he was even the type of guy to let Sunnis know, and that said a lot about him, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Gentlemen, we'll wrap up there, and it feels like we're just getting started, which of course we have, uh, but you'll both be back, I hope, um, as the, the weeks develop. Uh, thank you, Alan. No, thank you. I really enjoyed it, and uh, just looking forward to going forward. But it's, it's so nice to be in positive stuff now, Martin, isn't it? Yeah. Well, indeed, uh, there'll be plenty of uh, plenty of clouds to, to navigate, wee, of course. There'll be a wee bump in the road, but I think overall, this is going to be really good. It's going to be an enjoyable year. Uh, Andy, thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. It's, uh, it's a strange experience to go back and think back what 10-year-old Andy was thinking, but it's quite, <laughs> it's quite exciting, actually, because it was a, a really exciting time at a Rangers fan. Yeah, you just calm down when we get to 14-year-old Andy, please. <laughs> uh, okay, Ali McCoist, uh, when talking about that game, said that the hostility worked in our favour, that totally united the squad in a them against us way. We had to stick together as a team, that was obvious, and the dressing room atmosphere was quite simply superb. The big name boys and the lads who'd come up through the ranks mixed together. 
perfectly. Well, later that season, and especially in later years, Souness would create a Rangers side that would win games and trophies by playing some beautiful football, but it simply wasn't realistic for that to happen immediately. Rangers have been a laughing stock and a punch bag for years, and now, because of their newfound ambition, they were an even bigger target for aggression. Souness said that weekend that Rangers would have to match the aggression because I cannot allow us to be trampled on, and I won't as long as I am in charge at Ibrox. The lines then had been drawn from the very first battle. Like his iconic Liverpool side, the new look Rangers would have to be prepared to fight as much as they were programmed to play. And next week, we'll see just how well they play, whether it be old firm or new firm. Until then, bye for now. (laughs) 